Okay, so the second issue for today is Syria. And I don't have much time, and I don't want to take too much time of you. You will become tired of me. So um, i do a brief presentation, and then I'll be happy to answer questions. Somebody asked me, two people or three people asked me about Trump's deal of the century. Like, what he has in mind about uh, Israeli uh, peace with the Palestinians. I'll, I'll say a few words about it later. I know roughly about his plans. Okay, so this is Syria, very difficult place. And um, it tells uh, the story of the Middle East. If you look at Syria, so you see the borders are in the north with Turkey, uh, on the west with Lebanon, and then on the east with Iraq, and south, south west with Israel, and West Bank and, and Jordan. So, and I want to talk about, about Syria because of Iran. And I did not say um, what Iran wants to do in Syria, which could become a major, major challenge for Israel. It is already, but it could be even worse. So, this explains to you the problems in Syria. If Syria is divided into uh, areas uh, where ethnic groups where ethnic groups control. So on the left, you see the red, the Alawite. Alawite, 15% 15% only of the Syrian population. They control everything. So it's a it's a minority government. The Alawites is a splinter group from from the Shiite. So you see, uh, down in the, in the south, it's Druze. In the middle, Sunni. Up north, you see the green is, is uh, uh, Kurds. So you have all kinds of ethnic, national, and religious groups. And, uh, and they've never lived in peace with each other. And given the opportunity, the whole thing erupted into a major civil war. It has implications for the entire region, and obviously for Israel as well. Uh, here you see in the middle, you see it's like uh, purple, red. This was the area taken by the Islamic State. You see substantial chunks of Syria as well as of Iraq. Just to remind us, much of this area uh, was recovered by uh, Bashar al-Assad, but in certain areas, the Islamic State still controls, controls, controls this territory. So the, the, the war has not yet ended there. This is what happened in, in, in Syria in the last five to six years. Everybody is fighting everybody else. Everybody says the fighting is against terrorism. Everybody, everybody has different interests in mind. You look at Turkey, Turkey is only interested in the Kurds. And, uh, and uh, Russia wants uh, to preserve its interests in Syria, but Russia wants to make Syria a base for the projection of power and influence into the entire region. And Iran has a different idea, which I'm going to talk to, to, talk to you about in a minute. This is Putin. And Putin simply exploited the opportunity given to him by Obama to dominate Syria, and to show who is the strong man in the region. Well, this is, I now begin uh, a short presentation about what I call uh, the Iranian threat. See, the region is divided between the Shiites and the Sunnis. Uh, the Shiites, green, so Iran, Iraq is about 60% Shiite. Then you see Lebanon. Lebanon is also about 55 to 60% Shiite. And, and the red, Sunni. I don't have time now to go into this, but this is still a very powerful uh, driver in regional uh, politics. This historical, religious, ideological rift between these two major sections of Islam. 
And if you don't understand that, you don't understand anything. Now, the Shiites also exist in smaller numbers in other countries. So you see here, uh, they are in, so in Iran, you see, the, so we go, go to India, 10 to 15 percent, Pakistan, 10 to 15 percent, Afghanistan, 10 to 15 percent, Iran, 90 to 95 percent. I'm simply uh, reading from the map. Iraq, 65 to 70 percent. Syria, 15 to 20. Lebanon, 45 to 55. It is much more than 45. Kuwait, 20 to 25 percent. Shiites. Bahrain, 65 to 75 percent Shiites. Oman, Yemen, you look at Yemen, 35 to 40 percent. It's a huge civil war. Terrible, horrific civil war in Yemen. The Houthis, it's a Shiite sect, are fighting the Sunnis. Iran supports uh, the Houthis, and Saudi Arabia supports the Sunnis. So you see all kinds of regional warfare supported by, equipped by, regional powers. Saudi Arabia is fighting Iran in Yemen. Even Saudi Arabia has 10 to 15 percent Shiites. So what is the story here? And this is an, an important story. The story is Iran wants uh, to turn over uh, the governments of the Middle East, of the Sunni states, first of all, into uh, theocracies of the kind that exists in Iran itself, but also to dominate this entire region. So they use the Shiites, minorities everywhere, to, uh, to begin or to start little rebellions against the ruling Sunni governments. This is what they are doing all the time. And this is what I call the Shiite crescent. This is completely misunderstood in the West. Because the West, uh, Western Europe, and even this country, they do not understand what Iran wants to accomplish in the region. And this is what Iran wants to do. Iran wants to dominate the region via a crescent, a Shiite crescent. You see the crescent? You can see it down Yemen. It's like, it's like this, right? So you see Yemen, Iran, Iraq, Lebanon, Syria, and Lebanon, like this. And think that this crescent is designed to crush everything else on the way. Down into the Mediterranean. This is the main motivation for Iranian military interventions in Syria, in Yemen, and in other places. So nuclear, the, nuclear, the nuclear deal, the nuclear program, completely ignore that. Completely. You cannot isolate Iran from its hegemonial aspirations. And nuclear weapons is part of it. And I, know, I don't know of any serious expert that says that Iran does not want to build nuclear weapons. But in Western Europe, you find many people saying so. So here's the problem with Israel. These are Iran's proxies. So you have in Lebanon, you have Hezbollah. And in Iran, has paid billions of dollars to keep Hezbollah. Hezbollah has about 150,000 missiles, more than most of the countries that have missiles to begin with. Uh, they have the Islamic Jihad, as well as part of Hamas in Gaza. But they want another front. That front is in Syria. They want to establish a permanent military presence in Syria, as close as possible to the border with Israel. They also want to take over Jordan. So imagine, so Iran is around, wants to be around Israel. If you don't understand that, it's very difficult to understand uh, much of, of Iran's policies in the region. When Europe is telling Israel withdraw from the West Bank, 
establish a Palestinian state, which tomorrow could become another Gaza, how you deal with Iran? How you deal with Iran? No answer to that. So this is this is a typical typical thing, right? And this is uh, he asked in war. This is also not understood at all. What's what is happening in Gaza? Uh, like the last eight months of violence have to do a lot with Iran. There are all kinds of talks about, called in Arabic, it's called hudna, some kind of a ceasefire. Obviously, the, the, the Palestinians want a ceasefire not uh, as a step toward peace, but a, as a step to increase their military power and challenge to Israel. This is, this is part of the problem. I happen to believe that this was also done during the Oslo process. Not to end with a peace agreement, but to find better staging areas to continue the conflict. Now this is the, the leader of the military wing in Gaza. Guys with Iran, now fantastic. We are preparing battle for Palestine. We will not discuss recognizing Israel, only wiping it out. Did you hear? So, and he, he went to, to Tehran. So, there were talks about this ceasefire in Gaza. Who is against? Iran. What Iran does, provides weapons, equipment, money, money, hundreds of thousands of, hundreds of millions of dollars to the Islamic Jihad and other all kinds of organizations and part of, the, of, 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 the, of Hamas to conduct violence. Many people don't understand. The re most recent uh, violent acts were um, against, this is the thing, Israel is a victim of inter-Palestinian feud. So Mohammed Abbas got tired of Hamas, he's paying salaries, he's giving money to Hamas, and Hamas, uh, Hamas couldn't care less. So Mohammed Abbas said, I'm not giving you any more money. There's a crisis. No money for electricity. There are four hours of electricity every day. Who is to be blamed? And, and, uh, and I'm not giving you salaries. He cut the salaries by half. There's a crisis. What Hamas does with the crisis? Attacks Israel. Is this understood? No. But much of what has happened is because of that feud. Incidentally, I'm, I'm arguing that there's a huge problem with this separation between Gaza and the West Bank. The Palestinians cannot make peace between themselves, but they can make peace with the Jews. No. They cannot agree on anything. They fight each other. And uh, every day, Hamas cells are trying to undermine uh, Mahmoud Abbas and take over the West Bank. If elections were held today in the West Bank, which is a joke anyway, because there were no elections in the West Bank or Gaza for more than a decade, so you have Sunni dictatorship in Ramallah and you have an Islamic dictatorship in Gaza. And I hear all kinds of groups in the West saying, oh, we are for democracy and freedom in Palestine. There's no freedom, freedom in Gaza or the West Bank, and there is not going to be freedom in those places. Even if Israel completely withdrew from those places. Gaza became democratic? They controlled Gaza. What's going on here? What kind of stupid statements are these? Going back to Iran, so, these are the, the, so this is what they do. But this is, this is interesting. Because of the Iranian threats to the entire region, we see an attempt to counter the Shiite crescent. Remember the Shiite crescent? There's another crescent. This crescent is made of those countries who perceive Iran to be a major threat. Who are these countries? The Persian Gulf, 
Ikdoms, kingdoms, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Jordan, and, and Israel. So the Iranian threat, which I repeat, is the most important issue for the entire region. When I heard Obama saying on the nuclear deal, and he said so, only Israel opposed the deal, he did not tell the truth. The entire Sunni Arab world opposed the deal. When Obama said it's a deal or war, he also misled the public. This was not true because there was another measure in the middle, heavier sanctions. The sanctions brought the, the, uh, the uh, Iranians to, to negotiations to begin with. So this is a big, uh, surprising shifting in alliances. I call it the shifting alliances in the region. It has serious implications for Israel, even for the Palestinian-Israeli negotiations, and for the entire region. So, it is crescent. Now this crescent, the counter Sunni crescent, is supported by the United States. Obama destroyed American relations with the Sunni pro-Arab governments. He could not forgive uh, Assisi, the president of Egypt, for his coup against Mohammed Mursi of the Islamic of the Muslim Brotherhood. Could not forgive it. And he went against Saudi Arabia and against the Persian Gulf countries. He, Obama defined Iran as a, an ally of the United States. Trump defined Iran as an enemy of the United States. This is, this is a big difference. So this uh, counter crescent is supported by the United States. And so there is a strategic threat, whenever, no matter what you say about Trump. He is not, in, he's not reading much, he doesn't know much. This is, this is like a, a hunch of a simple person. <clears throat> so this crescent tells me that number one, the Sunni Arab countries could not care anymore about the Palestinians. I don't think that they ever cared about the Palestinians. They said so, but never did so. I remember uh, I wrote in one of my books, President Carter enough to admit that. He said, I was listening to what Arab leaders was, were saying about the Palestinian state, about the Palestinians, I was listening to them. Then when I met them, they said exactly the opposite. And he said so specifically about King Hussein. Of course, King Hussein never would have wanted a Palestinian state. So they, now they couldn't care less about the Palestinians. Even, even if they don't say so, they tell the Palestinians, you need to go along with the American plan for you. And um, so we see close collaboration, strategic, between Israel, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and the Persian Gulf countries. Am I happy with this kind of collaboration? The answer is not. Who, know, who wants a collaboration with a, with a country like Saudi Arabia, especially these days. But you don't have much choice because your bigger problem is Iran. And if you have actors, countries that are willing to collaborate with you against Iran, you, don't, you, you do not become selective. So, so we see here, that this is a little, little, little of surprise. We see here, very close collaboration until about, I know, about a year ago, this was completely under the table. But now, it is less and less. See this picture? You know who is the guy on the left? Sultan Qaboos of Oman. And there are now talks about Bahrain. And the Minister of Culture visited Abu Dhabi. These countries rely more on Israel for blocking Iran than they rely on anybody else, including the United States. 
And so this is a huge, a huge strategic transformation of the entire region. When you have this kind of strategic collaboration, it creates all kinds of other opportunities. So, this, uh, this brings me again to the situation in Syria, and then I'll say a few words about how could this impact um, Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. So Syria. But the problem is in Syria is, Israel has these problems with Syria. Number one is the attempt to build military infrastructure, uh, Iranian direct military infrastructure in Syria, not far from the Golan Heights. So the way to deal with it is by force. And Israel used force to try to destroy as much as possible those attempts. Second problem is transfer of weapons, sophisticated weapons, more weapons, more missiles to Hezbollah in Lebanon. So what happened is that Syria became a country for smuggling weapons, sophisticated weapons, accurate weapons, missiles, from Syria, via, from, from Iran, via Syria, to Hezbollah in Lebanon. Third problem was the, um, the um, imp improvement of existing missiles, which are blind, which means not accurate. Most of those missiles that Hezbollah has are such, with GPS and accuracy uh, uh, equipment. This presents a major threat to Israel. Factories, like whole factories. Syria attempted to build these factories on, on Syrian territory. What do you do? You use force on all of these places. What is the problem? Russia has become a problem. So there were some kinds of rules of the game that Israel established with Russia. Uh, we allow you to use force inside Syria for the purposes that I cited, but up to a point. What happened a few, a few, a few months ago is that Syrian anti-aircraft battery, you heard about that, they shut down a, a Russian reconnaissance plane. I happen to believe that they did it on purpose. You could be dumb and not trained, but you could not mistaken this slow plane or Israeli combat planes, especially when those planes left the area long before those missiles were, were um, traveling into the Russian planes. I, and I think that Syria did it on purpose to change the rules of the game. And since then, despite Israeli efforts to ameliorate the situation, to repair the situation, uh, the uh, Russian, um, Russian position remained very tough. So right now, there are all kinds of limitations on the ability of the Israeli Air Force to accomplish the goals I have uh, mentioned earlier in Syria. So Israel is using less force, and therefore the threat increases. Uh, it remains to be seen how this is going to evolve, but Iran would not stop its attempts to build uh, a third front for Israel, like Lebanon, Gaza, and a third front in Syria and would not stop to topple the government of Jordan. Would not stop. Now, the question is also going to be, what will happen to the counter-Crescent alliance? This uh, merger of Hashjuji uh, in, in, in Turkey, which implicated uh, Hamad bin Salman, 
MBS these days. Complicated the whole thing. Because it infuriated the United States and other countries. So the alliance that Trump was trying to build with Saudi Arabia is now being compromised. See the picture there? This is an Israeli attempt, also attempt by the Persian Gulf countries to, to a certain extent, replace Saudi Arabia. It is a message that says, okay, Saudi Arabia is a little bit in trouble. We'll wait until it recovers. But in the meantime, we are not dismantling the counter, um, counter Shiite crescent, crescent that we are building. So I think this is, you have to, you have to understand that there are, there's, a, there's always an equilibrium in the region. So if, if one piece fails, other pieces then take over. There's no vacuum. And I think that this is the, this is the way to explain or to account for what, what is happening between Israel and the Persian Gulf countries these very days. Now, what does it mean, this counter-alliance about Israeli-Palestinian negotiations? First of all, Trump has a plan. I have not seen it, but I know parts of it. And Trump, as someone told me earlier, uh, Trump said that he transferred the embassy to Jerusalem and applied pressure on the Palestinians. It's now Israel's turn to compensate. And I can tell you two things about the plan. One th uh, and, and, and whenever we talk about Israeli-Palestinian negotiations, there's always an issue, there's always, uh, there are always two issues. One is process, and the other one is substance. I disagree that the process is not important. The process is always critical. Whom you negotiate with, at what level, what are the issues, at what kind of order, what kind of assurances. The process is as important as substance. But in the past, I would hear, especially in Europe, oh, the process is not important. They forget their own negotiations over the European Union. The process is very important. See now the Brexit. So what, what the EU applies for itself does not apply to everybody else. Now, so first let me talk about the process. The process assumes that the two sides cannot make an agreement on their own. There were no real negotiations for almost 10 years. I think mainly because of the Palestinian area. Uh, so the two sides, and maybe there is less interest in the present Israeli government. I said that there were other governments which were interested but couldn't go anywhere. Now, so what do you do? There are three models of negotiation. One is direct negotiations, which is the best one. The other one is international sponsored negotiations. This is what the Palestinians want. The third one is the regional approach. This is what, Trump's, this is what Trump wants. What is the regional approach? means since the Palestinians themselves cannot make concessions, they cannot agree on anything, they will, have the pr they will be pressured, but also supported by the pro-American Sunni Arab states, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, etc. They will uh, apply pressure on them, but also offer them, you know, it's sticks and carrots. Uh, these countries will apply a combination of sticks and carrots on the Palestinians. Palestinians on their own would not uh, enter negotiations and would not make any concessions. But if pressed from the outside, maybe. This is the thinking. It may not be valid, but this is the thinking. So the idea is to, uh, to offer a plan, to wrap up it with regional Support, and then this process may work. So Palestinians do, do not want this kind of a process. They want internationalization of the negotiation. So they go to Europe, they go, France offered to do that, uh, other countries offered to host like all kinds of international bodies. Why the Palestinians want international bodies? 
But they think that the pressure would then be applied mostly on Israel, not on them. This is about the process. Not substance. The main assumption of the Trump administration is that, uh, that a Palestinian state is not, uh, not um, a realistic posture. And therefore, one has to circumvent that. And the way they want to do it is by creating some kind of a confederation between Gaza, the West Bank, and Jordan. The problem is that confederations are usually established by independent states. So how you can create a confederation when you do not establish an independent Palestinian state? When Mahmoud Abbas, incidentally, was asked about it, he said, I am in, I am in favor only if Israel would join this kind of a confederation. Israel cannot join this kind of a confederation because confederation, this is a political science theory, depends on compatibility between and among regimes. Israel is a democracy. It cannot create a confederation with dictatorships or monarchies. Jordan is a monarchy. Dictatorship. Uh, the Palestinian Authority is a dictatorship. Hamas is a dictatorship. And you need also a reconciliation between Hamas and, and the Palestinian Authority. All efforts of our have faith to do that. But this is the idea. No Palestinian state. No major evacuation of um, Israeli settlements in the West Bank. There is this idea of territorial exchanges. So the big blocks of Jewish settlements in the West Bank, uh, it's called Malea Dumim and Gush Etzion and the area around Ariel, about, say, 3%, 4% of the territory, which includes about 80% of, the, of, the, of Jews, will remain in Israeli hands. The Palestinians will get compensation in Gaza. That's the, that's the territorial exchange idea. So, um, Trump, then his, his plan uh, is, uh, is to, to reject the Palestinian state and to offer something else. But I can only tell you from, from history and from my own research and theory. Whenever the United States came up with a detailed plan for peace, it was rejected by the two sides. From, especially since 1967. Why? Because every side, first of all, sees the concessions he must do and ignores the concessions of the other side. Remember, uh, Rogers, uh, William Rogers was one minister, uh, secretary of state in the Nixon administration. He came up with a very detailed plan. It was immediately rejected by Gamal Abdel Nasser and, and Golda Meir of Israel because of that principle which I have mentioned to you earlier. Carter came up, President Jimmy Carter in 1976 came up with a major peace plan, and this inspired Sadat to seek, in, to seek on his own resolution with Israel. And we have, we have successful examples of peace processes between Israel and the Arab states. And this model tells you how it should be done. I can tell you that this was quite interesting. Uh, during the Clinton years, uh, he was looking for a major uh, breakthrough in Israeli-Syrian relations. His foreign minister was uh, Warren Christopher. So Warren Christopher went to Yitzhak Rabin, who was prime minister at the time, and said, uh, Assad, this is the father Assad, Hafez al-Assad, that he's willing to negotiate agreement with you. But he insists on Israel's complete withdrawal from the Golan Heights, assuming that this condition is given. What would you demand in compensation? The Rabin did not understand the catch-22 situation here. The Rabin said, Rabin didn't say anything about the withdrawal. 
He only said, we need very strict security conditions and a peace agreement of the kind we have with Egypt. So Warren Christopher went to Assad and told Assad, you know what, I have big news, I have good news. Rabin gave up on the Golan Heights. He demands now, one, two, three, four, five. Assad said, this is how the Arabs negotiate. Fine, now that I have the Golan Heights, let's negotiate the rest of it. So Christopher goes back to Rabin and, and said something like this. Rabin said, Rabin continued the process. He said, um, okay, um, Assad wants the peace process with us, same kind of process that Egypt had with Israel. But Assad said, I want, I want the entire Golan Heights returned to me, like all of Egypt, like all of Sinai. Rabin said, fair enough, but you cannot have half of the Egyptian example. I want Assad, first of all, come to Jerusalem, recognize Israel, speak to the parliament, offer full peace, exchanges of uh, exchange, diplomatic exchanges. We, we want to have an embassy in, in Damascus. If he is prepared to do that, we'll negotiate. So Christopher went back to Assad. Assad said, are you crazy? This was the end of it. But it tells you something about successful models versus unsuccessful models. I, I applied all of that to the Israeli-Palestinian um, situation, find out that it's very similar to the Assad thing rather than to the Egyptian model. Now, given all of that, right now, because Israel will have elections sooner or later, uh, the next elections uh, are scheduled to take place in November. Nobody believes that this government with a majority of one would last that long. So it could be any time between, say, March, April, May, something like that, of 2019. So now the Trump administration says maybe we should not publicize or announce our plan until after the elections because uh, the elections are going to concentrate just on the plan, and as a result of it, uh, it may compromise the chances of that plan to be accepted by both sides. So what I'm saying is that there is a plan. Trump wanted to announce that plan a month ago, not a month, a month ago, something like February, March of, 19, of 2018. It didn't work out because of, or, or because of the transfer of the embassy to Jerusalem and because of the sanctions he took against the Palestinians. Palestinians don't want to talk to him. So, uh, so he held up. He was hold, holding this up. Now there's another complication. But I also, tell, I, want, I also want to tell you that this plan is based on the territorial issue. In other words, uh, that the main obstacle to peace is the territorial issue. The size of the Palestinian state and the type of a Palestinian state. And I don't have time to go into this, but I think this is the wrong focus. If the territorial issue had been the main issue, there would have been a Palestinian state years ago. How many years ago? Going back to 1937. We went a little bit uh, further, 1940, uh, 1947, the petition resolution. West Bank was in Arab hands from 1948 to 1967. Gaza was in Egyptian hands. Why the Palestinians did not establish a state then? All the territorial proposals made by President, Prime Minister Barak from the Labour Party, Clinton, Democratic Party in the United States. Uh, then there was another one by Eud Ormer in 2008. And then another one by Joe Biden, the Democrat, 
as Vice President for Obama, all of them were rejected. But does he tell me that the territorial issue is not the main problem? What is the main problem? This is a whole lecture in itself. So, I think Trump may come up with his plan sooner or later, but I'm not optimistic about the chances of that plan to really do the work that, plan, that Trump plans to do or to accomplish. And, and to sum up, I think that uh, the Iranian threat is still uh, the major challenge to Israel and to the United States. It's also to Europe, but Europe does not recognize that. And that the shifting alliances now show that <laughs> much, much of the attention, the focus on all that is happening in the region should be directed vis-a-vis -vis Iran. The, um, the, the, the pro-American uh, states, Sunni Arab states, are angry at the Palestinians that in their own mind are undermining the building of an anti-Iranian coalition. This has never been the case before. To what extent this would be sufficient to really start, to really uh, restart negotiations is highly doubtful. Yeah, yeah, you know, you know, people are divided into, some people are optimistic, some people are pessimistic. And I, I belong to people who are realistic. You know, realist, real, realistic people are optimistic people with experience. So we have this kind of experience for many, many years now. It's not always nice to end a lecture with a realistic you, this is uh, the real view. Thank you. OK, we have Thank you so just much. a few is, minutes for questions. Yes, is there some questions? I'm asking a question because I worry. And the question is, what are the options for that it will be in year 2030, still a state called Eretz Israel. We have survived 70 years, and uh, Israel is now stronger than before. I think the, the worst years were 1947, 1948, in the 50s. I think that the what I can tell you is from, from, from the from a theory of conflict resolution, all conflicts end. But the question is only when they will end and what would be the conditions to end them. The conditions right now, especially remember Iran, right? Remember Iran. The conditions right now are not uh, ripe for resolution. Ripe for resolution is a theoretical notion are not ripe for resolution. I think the conditions were good at the beginning of the Oslo process. I happen to believe that if there was any Palestinian leader that could have made the necessary concessions, it was Arafat. But he didn't want to. Mahmoud Abbas is almost at the end of his, of his rule. His successors will compete for who is going to be more anti-Israel. You, you need a partner. You, cannot, you cannot, cannot achieve an agreement without a relevant partner. If you ask me if, if, the, if the issue is Israel-Palestine, that's a long time to go. There are all kinds of things you can do in the middle, which for political reasons I don't want to go into this. But I think, and I hope that you have paid attention, to what I said about the Sunni pro-American Arab countries. There's a very good chance that we will see some dramatic changes here, including open, open agreements, including agreements, open, in the open, that would completely change the equation. If this were to happen, I think Israel will become stronger, not weaker. 
I also hope so. Not a question here, just a moment. Hi, uh, I was wondering, how long do you think it will take before the European Union will recognize Iran as a problem? <laughs> I mean, it will eventually become a problem if it grows. I don't know, it will take forever. Uh, Again, I, I was in Brussels a year ago, and I, the, all of the questions, I was speaking about Iran, and they were, talk, they were talking about Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. They did not even connect the two. I don't know what will happen. Uh, I thought that by now, by now uh, changes will occur. I can tell you that, what, uh, that Eastern Europe has a completely different opinion. And um, it's interesting to note, you know, the EU has to adopt a significant, uh, no, any resolution unanimous, unanimously. So Magrini attempted to issue a very tough statement about Jerusalem. Eastern Europe said no. And there was no tough resolution about Jerusalem. So uh, the only thing, you know, this organization works in Eastern Europe. So one way of perhaps um, promoting a change would be through Eastern Europe. But and the other, the other, the other things have to change in Europe itself in order to facilitate better understanding of what is happening in the region. So uh, when we came here, we offered uh, lectures and briefings to all kinds of organizations, they don't want to hear. They don't want to listen. No, liberal Europe, freedom of speech. Oh, we are liberal. I, I don't find any liberalism here. Deaf ears, right? Because it's, it's complicated. It is, um, it is uh, pessimistic. It is problematic. Why not sign a deal with Iran? Iran will become a, 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 a country seeking peace in the region. Why to hear all, all of the evidence that I'm suggesting? You know, people, want, want, people want to be left alone. I don't care less about the killing in Syria until the refugee issue came out. What you can make out of it? So I'm... I'm I am I'm in favor, or, or I think, this kind of changes have to go through an evolutionary process. I can tell you that there were labor-led governments in Israel. Say tomorrow the Labor Party wins the elections in Israel. You think that it's going to be very different? We have the experiences already of years of labor-led governments. Did anything change? Well, there are very, very huge problems with the other side, but when you blame Israel all the time, and your government gave the Palestinians, like, recognized Palestine as a state in 2015, this was a foolish action. Why was it foolish? Because the Palestinians want recognition without making any concession. So why to negotiate? If they can get everything without making any concessions, why to negotiate? Why to negotiate? So the answer was, oh, we are, we are applying pressure on Israel. You are not applying pressure on Israel. You are, you are promoting Palestinian rejectionism and unwillingness to negotiate. It's a rational thing. If you get what you want without concessions, why would you negotiate? If you vote for all kinds of delegitimization uh, resolutions at UNESCO and the UN Council on Human Rights, what is the message? Oh, we can, we, we, we can, we can apply pressure on Israel to cave in. Don't do anything. So it's counterproductive. That's the whole thing. Oh, I, my argument is that Swedish and Scandinavian and European one-sided resolutions of this kind not only help peace processes, they accomplish exactly the opposite of peace processes. 
when Europe is going to realize that, it's me. Could have realized that a long time ago. Because it's, it's simple thinking. It's not too sophisticated. But you have to have the willingness to listen. If you don't want to listen, then you continue with field policies and understanding of what is happening. Okay, hey, last question over here. Just a moment. Uh, do you think uh, that it is possible to build up uh, democracy in Islamic countries? No. Not in the foreseeable future. And the reasons for that is very simple. This is what uh, uh, the Arab Spring uh, shows us. Democracy has to be evolved. It has to be built on institutions, rights, um, all kinds of, of rights. Uh, it has to be built on understanding of what democracy is. The Middle East is not yet prepared for that. And all European big experts on the Muslim world said, no, you know that, you know where the Arab Spring term came from? Not from the Middle East, it came from Europe. Because uh, experts and politicians apply the European experience of the Middle East. But the Middle East is not Europe. And when the United States invaded Iraq, and wanted to impose democracy, people in, there was so much terrorism in, in Baghdad and Iraq, the people said, we don't care about democracy, we care about life. A democracy versus life, I prefer life. So this was, this was a very stupid assumption uh, to think that, oh, you can impose democracy from above. It doesn't work like that. You cannot impose peace, incidentally, either. When peace was imposed in Germany in Versailles. We saw the results. So I don't think that, I think that the only, the only, the only thing that the West perhaps could have done is to promote the conditions necessary to slowly develop democracy. Look at Eastern Europe. How many years since uh, the end of the Soviet rule? 1990? What is it uh, now? Uh, 28 years? Democratic processes have not yet been completed there. For 28 years. And this is Europe, not the Middle East. So who is the clever person who thought that democracy could come with that toppling of Mubarak in Egypt? And why that person was so happy that Mohammed Mursi, the representative of the Muslim Brotherhood, could enact democracy when what they want is theocracy, not democracy. It's one vote, one time like Hamas in Gaza. Where it comes from? Ignorance. Lack of historical depth. If you don't understand Shia versus Sunni, you don't, you don't understand anything. Most of these people whom I meet, politicians, have very little understanding of knowledge of what is, what is really happening. And therefore, they come up with oversimplified solution. Let's get out of the West Bank, establish a Palestinian state, not only you will have peace between Israel and the Palestinians, you will, have, you will have peace in the entire region. You still hear that. You still hear that from people who are completely ignorant and could not even draw one simple lesson from what was happening in the region for the last, say, six years, seven years. So our job, I go back to our organization, is to educate people, to tell the truth, Tell them the truth. Problem is that in some places they don't want to listen because truth is not pleasant. They want to hear only, oh, you support uh, the West Bank for a Palestinian state, we will hear you. We'll give you prices, we'll give you money, we'll give you awards. If you say exactly the opposite, you are extremist, you are rightist. And this is what you hear all the time. Is it easy to, to fight that? No, it's not easy. Could we continue? Yes, because this is the only way to educate people. 
And once we, try, once we educate people sufficiently, they're going perhaps to be successful in the long run. We, we, uh, we supplement our activity with media appearances. Tomorrow, I think, or the day after tomorrow, I'll have a, a, my article, op-ed article in, in one of your papers. What is it? The Swedish Daily News. Yes. So, and then I wrote something about Swedish-Israeli Swedish relations. So you, you're welcome to follow that up. Okay, one final question, then we are finished. The other one was the final question, no? <laughs> Just in short, what could you tell us about Khashoggi? Who was he? What's his background? Was this, this, why was he murdered? Was this, this just a liberal journalist? And the, this what is, was this? This was the most stupid execution one can think of. Um, you know, you execute people in the, in the Middle East all the time. You execute leaders, you execute opposers. This is, this is, if you don't agree with somebody, you execute him. Speaking about democracy, right, in the Middle East. Once it stops, I would say this is the first step toward democracy. So this was, this was not unusual. What was unusual and very stupid is to do it in Turkey, in Istanbul, to do it in a clumsy way. You, you, can, you can run this person with a car. Not that I support it. But it was so stupid. The way it was done it was so stupid that only for this kind of stupidity, this uh, MBS should have been gone, that, that uh, Mahmoud bin Salman. So this person was not that important. He, he was in Washington. He wrote for, again, this person was in Washington, not an American citizen, writing for the Washington Post. They should have, should have predicted that, uh, the American response. You know, Trump is, is very friendly with the Saudi. And he, he, he groomed. Mahmoud bin Salman. So to do that for Trump was a huge miscalculation, huge mistake. And we don't know uh, how far it will go and what would be the, the real results out of it. But this is the Middle East. This, this is, you, know, you hear about it only when Akshugi uh, yeah, lives in America and writes for the Washington Post. What about the other Thousands of cases like this that happen on a regular basis. Thanks for coming. It was very interesting for me to hear your questions. And Thank you so much, uh, dear professor. You have given so very important facts that we can take with us in our different missions. So very glad to have you here and very honored for us. Thank you so very much, professor. Thank you. Thank you.